Welcome back to Occult Symbolism and Pop Culture. I'm your host, Isaac Wiseup. Today, I've got a very special announcement. It's a very special show. As you can tell from the title, today we are going to discuss Twin Peaks. I know I've hinted about this for months. And even as I'm doing this, I'm hesitant to commit to this plan. But I'm going to. If there's one thing I know about setting goals... Sometimes you got to get as close as you can to what you think is going to be the perfect thing, and then you just got to go for it, all right? So today, I'm going to make my formal announcement about how we're going to tackle the symbolism of Twin Peaks, because between season one, two, and three in the movie, you got over 50 hours of content, plus add in all the books, you've got a couple thousand pages of books. Then you've got this repository of occult knowledge in my dumb brain I gotta hash through and compare to the content. I got some research to do. I got a couple more books I gotta read. This is gonna take a minute, right? For us to get through the whole Twin Peaks saga and decode the whole thing. But today's episode is its an announcement but it's entirely going to be about what this show is, how I got sucked into this world, how this show was created from David Lynch and Mark Frost. We'll talk about the locations of the filming, including some relevant information about how it's tied into ancient human sacrifice at one of the filming locations. I also, it has a link to your boy Epstein. Oh, yeah. We're also going to talk about the music, but ultimately, in the end, I'm going to tell you how we are going to approach decoding the vast occult symbolism of Twin Peaks. And listen up, before it's all over, I'm going to drop some shout outs on this show, but before the end of the show, I brought some coupons. That's right, it's coupon time, everybody. Clip those coupons. We're in a recession. <laughs> I brought the coupons. So I'm going to I'm gonna tell you the coupon code, how you can get into the VIP section at cost. You're going to steal from me. You're going to steal my two books, my two most popular books. You're going to steal them from me. And you're going to get a month of ad-free episodes. The bonus content, and you're going to go with us behind the scenes of my Twin Peaks decoding because I'm going to write a book about this, okay? And I want you to join me as I learn, research, regurgitate. You're going to be a part of this journey, but you got to be on the supporter feeds. That's right. And I know, oh, all the, all the, all, listen up, all you free feed losers out there, pissing and moaning and crying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you in there for a couple bucks. Everyone's got two lousy dollars. Come on. Or you can wait, right? Or you can wait because what I want to do is I want, and I'm going to go into this. I'm trying to stick to my outline here. The next, I would say, 6 to 12, at the worst, 18 months, I'm going to be diving through every episode of Twin Peaks, all the books, and all the occult symbolism that you can find on the show, because I think it's very relevant. A magnum opus, dare I say, of decoding entertainment. It's going to take a long time. I plan on writing a whole book about this and using all the information that I will be presenting to you on a recurring basis to be determined weekly, monthly, bi monthly. I'm not sure. It just depends how long it takes. And I want you to go behind the scenes with me and learn with us. We're going to unfold the story. I'm going to be your guide through Twin Peaks. And when the idea, the idea is, at the end of this all, I will have a book I can release. And then, you know, if you're a free feed loser for life, that's okay. You can get the book at the end of it all. I'm still going to, I'm still, I'm going to put you in a chokehold down Grifter Alley one way or another. Okay. 
Anyway, okay. So you know what we're going to talk about today. Twin Peaks, we're going to talk about the show quite a bit. And then I'm going to tell you the exact plan of how I'm going to break down the most controversial conspiracy theory of all entertainment history. First, some housekeeping. I want to give a special thanks to Demi from Thoughtful Dots. She does mandala art. She's this artist. She hand paints these amazing mandala pieces. All right. They've got sacred geometry, symmetry in the designs. You can see it if you're watching the video version of this show. You can see it right behind me on my studio wall. I try to get out the way. I might have to. I might have to move it over because if I sit, if I sit incorrectly, it looks like I've got a. I've got a turtle shell on. So I might have to slide it over. Anyway, doesn't matter. The sacred geometry is a very fascinating subject to me. This goes back to the beginning of all of the symbolism talk. Back to Pythagoras. He started the first secret society, passing down sacred knowledge that he was compiling and synthesizing on his travels. And when I look at this piece of art, I can see how, you know, she says when she's doing it, she gets into a flow state, a meditative state. And even when you stare at it, it feels like I'm almost able to achieve that a similar flow state if you stare at it long enough, right? Like sometimes I'll just sit here and stare at it. That's how we're going to, I'm going to stare at it thinking about Twin Peaks. Uh, but it's a beautiful piece. And and the thing with the flow state, that actually resonates with me. She talks about this on, uh, if you want, listen to her Bledsoe Said So interview she did. The way she does this is really neat to me because I've practiced meditation on and off for several years just to handle stress, you know, nothing crazy. I'm not into transcendental meditation like David Lynch, not yet at least. But as a way to handle stress, calm down the stories of the mind, the Buddha's called the monkey mind. It can get your brain into that alpha wave mode, which is very healthy and therapeutic for you. It's a way of getting you into the present. You're not dealing with anxiety about things in the future you're not dealing with depression and shame about things from the past you're in the present you're in the now just like that ram das book says be here now right and i currently i'm able to get into i think a flow state an alpha wave state mode in crossfit during the longer wads i find this happening you know you tunnel vision out because it's so miserable, you your brain sort of dissociates and you tunnel vision out. I don't even know what the music playing is anymore. I'm such I'm I'm only in the now. I'm like, okay, I got five more reps or whatever. It forces you into that state, and it's very therapeutic for me. Um, and uh, let's see here, what else was I going to talk to you about? Oh yeah, the Google. <laughs> I'm getting on. It's going to turn into a whole show piece. The Google Lambda chat bot. If you remember that show we did about that, that episode, it talked about how artificial intelligence experiences time at a variable rate, which is actually what this is talking about when you when you focus and live in the present. Right. Uh, But anyway, for Demi, let's keep it on track. It's all about creating this art, which I now get to post on the studio wall with all the other beautiful uh, I got listener art. I've got friends art that was handed to me. Some I bought. Uh, but yeah, this is gonna this this is a piece. This and and Demi, this is for you. This is a message for you. This is what what the, your your art is gonna do for me. It's gonna it's gonna be a reminder. Cause I sit here at my little research desk and I'm pulling my hair out. I'm stressing out. I'm freaking out all the time. This is gonna be a reminder to try to live in the present. To try to live in the now. Okay. That's what the, this is for me. And it's a very beautiful piece. I walk by my, my it's, it's the office, okay? I call it my studio for you guys, like, as if I'm Joe Rogan over here. It's just the damn office. And uh, I see, the, I see the, the little mirrors bouncing off the light. It's beautiful. But it is amazing how uh, Demi, she hand paints these things. I appreciate it. It's not mass-produced art. You know, that's why I love, uh, you know, Phil, Phil painted me the... Uh, the Phil, the surfing conspiracy theorist, painted me the UFO over the in- Indonesia there. Skinny Fresh did this insane piece over here. And I got a bunch more, too, on the wall. I'll, I'll, I'll make a post on Instagram, and I'll tell you who did which one. Uh, so, anyway, so I love having that local artist feel, but it's even more special to me because a lot of these people are listeners or friends or both. So that's really cool. Mine's got this really, Demi did this really cool personalized alien consciousness theme. I love it. It's great. 
Anyway, enough of that. Um, you could check her out. I want you to go look at her art on her Instagram at thoughtful dots. She's got a, a massive following, much larger than my following, uh, and for good reason. She's making insanely beautiful art, and she's got a website. Uh, I want to tell you about this stuff, you know, because I, I really do appreciate her. A lot of people are amazed by her art. Thoughtful dots dot com, and she's got a YouTube channel where uh, I think it's also thoughtful dots where she tells you how you can create your own art. Uh, but just go to thoughtfuldots.com. She'll she'll show you all the stuff, all the links. Uh, and and that's how I know she's a real one. She's a real artist. She's she's glad to help you do your own art like this on her YouTube channel. She'll straight up show you. She's like, yeah, this is how I do it. You know, there's no secrecy. I really dig that. It's like um, it's like how I try to tell you guys where I get my information. You know, like some people want to withhold and pretend they're just this repository of all this great knowledge and you know i'm like look i'm trying to learn i'm trying to figure this out too like we're all in this together like here's all the books and i need to make a list everyone keeps asking what's the full list it's a massive list of books that i have uh it just depends on which one i need to get into but anyway so demi and i are on the same page in that sense i i feel so anyway you can and you can check her interview out on bledsoe said so you can hear about how she does all this and uh you know, the inspiration behind it. So anyway, thank you, Demi. Go check her out at thoughtful dots. Look at the show notes. Okay. She's a really amazing, hum- humble, uh, you know, genuine artist. So I just wanted to share that. I'll put a link in the show notes though. Cause I want you guys to check it out too. Okay. Moving on. Twin peaks, my journey into twin peaks. I, and you probably heard me talk about this on, I've been on several shows. You, you hear me constantly derailing the argument the discussion into twin peaks and there's a reason for that it's because it's been uh what do you got like a mind worm festering and i can't stop it i'm i'm going insane i'm literally going insane i resisted watching this show for many years i've denied it and back when i started this whole thing this whole blog book writing thing back in 2011 I constantly get people telling me, hey, you need to check out Twin Peaks. You're into all this occult symbolism. That's the show you need to watch. And I'm, you know, and I get lots of requests and, and things like that all the time. And this is a show that wasn't even on my radar in the 90s. No idea. I know nothing about the show. Literally nothing. Besides people telling me, you got to watch this show. I've heard of it. I know it existed. No idea what it meant, what it was. Nothing. Because back in 1990, when this show, when season one came out, I was 11 years old. I was obsessed with wrestling at the time, which I believe back then it was NWA and WCW. Not the band NWA. I think that was the National Wrestling Alliance. And at some point they turned into WCW. But back then, and I the only shows I remember watching, I had to look up what was popping in 1990. Uh, Who's the Boss? That's where I fell in love with Alyssa Milano. Uh, <laughs> Growing Pains, where I fell in love with Kirk Cameron, but he's an insane person now, isn't he? I don't know, is he? He's doing all that uh, fire and brimstone stuff. I haven't checked any of it out. Uh, the Simpsons, The Wonder Years, with uh, old girl is like a math whiz now. Uh, Full House, rest in peace, Bob Saget. Cheers, and I, th- I'm, you know, I was watching cartoons. I think back then, GI Joe, Transformers, all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Twin Peaks was. I was too young for Twin Peaks, basically. And I've had more requests to watch this show and discuss this show than any other piece of entertainment over the last what are we at now? Twelve years, and I see why. It's a total mind bender. Okay, it's the scratch you can't itch. It buries into the subconscious. You can't turn it off. But the problem is, all of that only happens after you finish the whole show. Because my experience watching it, if you follow my Twitter and you saw my constant pissing and moaning over this, was that I, I, I constantly was questioning if I should finish this show. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But after I completed the whole thing, I found myself incessantly thinking about it wanting to rewatch it and i went through this second period of denial after i finished it 
telling myself, there's no way in hell I'm sitting through all these episodes a second time, spending another 50 hours on this show. It's too much. It's too much. But here we are. I tried to move on, but I can't. <laughs> and, uh, and, and and let me give you a little background on what actually what actually prompted me. Because over the years, like I said, I kept getting requests. At one point, I think Twin Peaks was on Netflix for a while. Either way, I would start episode one. I'd see Laura Palmer wrapped in plastic. I'd make it 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes into the pilot episode. And I'd just be like, this is boring. I don't know. This is stupid. I tried that several times. I would say, honestly, probably, I don't know, three, four, five times I tried it. Gave up on the first episode. But then something magical happened to me. Back in October, I got sick. I thought I had long-haul COVID. I got COVID, and I thought I had long-haul COVID because I was sick from October of 22 to, I think, April of 23. So just recently, right? I got sick, and I couldn't. I, I was just sick the whole time. I had no idea what was going on. I went to the doctor. They put a camera up my nose, and it turns out it was a sinusitis. I had a, a a sinus infection in the back of my cavity. There, it was my whole nose was swollen up the whole time. So all the antibiotics I was taking weren't even getting back there. I guess. So they put me on this whole other regimen, fixed me up. I feel like a million bucks now. And I thought I had long haul because I was like, I've never been sick like this in my life. This is insane. Because it happened after I got the thing, you know. The thing from 2020, I thought it was never going away for me. And my uh, my one CrossFit coach, when I first got it, I said, bro, where you been? Where you been, homeboy? And I, I remember texting him. I said, I said, yeah, the doctor said it uh, would have killed a weaker man. And I, I thought I was going to die. I thought, oh, how fitting. I'm making fun of this stuff, and now it's going to get me. So anyway, I'm better now. But anyways, I was sick for six months. And that's when I watched Twin Peaks. I started it because I was just had nothing else to watch. I was like, here we go. Let's do it. Made it to like episode four or five of the first season. I wanted to quit. My 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 partners, my my double R diner partners, I'm going to shout them out later. They said, no, you got to stick with it. I said, OK. So I made it through season one and then I started season two. I'm like, that's pretty good. Make it halfway through season two. I was like, this is stupid. I hate it again. Do I need to finish this now? I said, you got you to gotta keep going. So I finish it. It was fine. And then I watched the movie Fire Walk With Me, and that's when the light bulb flipped off, and I said, oh, damn, I like this show. Then I watched season three, same thing, halfway through. I'm like, this is stupid. This Dougie character is driving me nuts. I don't, what, what am I watching here? Then I finished it, and it was like, Poof. romance explosion in the mind. So today I... I am on a journey, and I want you to join me. We're going to explore the world of Twin Peaks from the first season to the third, from the films to the books, from the window to the walls. I'll explain more. <laughs> I'll explain more about what is... I can't say from the window to the walls without the other part, okay? You'll have to look that up. I'm, I'm trying to keep this a safe-for-work podcast. But I'll explain more about what this is going to look like at the end of this episode. So you got to stick with me. And this is lo- long episodes, folks. I got a lot to talk about. But spoiler alert, you're going to have to wait a long time to get the finished product. All right. I'm going to give you the opportunity, though, a once in a lifetime opportunity. If you're listening to it, this episode, this is your once in a lifetime. You get to join me behind the scenes. As I craft and unpack what I hope to be the ultimate Twin Peaks occult symbolism guide. The ultimate. Many have tried, but they have failed. And where they have failed, we will succeed. David Lynch laughs at these theories. Well, he ain't going to laugh at this one. Because we're going to put him out on Front Street. (laughs) Okay, so. What's Twin Peaks? Dare I say Twin Peaks is the greatest television series of all time. Dare I say it. But to be fair, I don't watch a lot of TV, TV series. I watch a lot of films and online streamers and TV series, just not a lot of mainstream cable shows, right? 
like I watch I'll watch a lot of stupid reality shows, dating shows, game shows. I watch chat the challenge and survivor, right? But as far as television series, and this is all very subjective, but my favorite television series, of course, Twin Peaks, which I I I, I feel like it's got to be the top for me, for my personal preferences. But the other ones I would say are some of the greatest of all time to give you a vibe on my preferences. The Office, The Sopranos, I love The Sopranos, love Boardwalk Empire, uh, Breaking Bad, Dexter, Gilligan's Island. Didn't see that one coming, did you? South Park, X-Files, which I didn't realize in the 90s was a uh, clear Twin Peaks inspired show. Uh, some of the other shows would be Game of Thrones, Cheers, Twilight Zone, Tales from the Dark Side. I like the Friday the 13th TV show, if you ever watch that. Seinfeld, albeit I'd never seen an episode of Seinfeld, it's true. But I've seen enough chunks of it that I feel like, oh, I should watch that one day. Uh, Stranger Things, White Lotus, Westworld, Six Feet Under. Point is, Twin, Fe- Twin, Pe- <laughs> Twin Peaks might be the best one. Depends on your mood. But yet it somehow crosses multiple genres. Does it very well. So maybe it doesn't depend on you. Maybe you can watch it under any mood. Honestly, that's what makes it so strange. It's got horror, romance, comedy, drama. And it does every single one of those very effectively. I don't know if you can find another show like it. I really don't. I don't think it exists. No one else has been able to do that. But again, I haven't seen many TV series. So there's that. But it's very difficult to succinctly describe Twin Peaks because I've been trying to talk to people. I'm shocked at how few people have watched this show. When I talk to them about it, they'll ask me what it's about, and I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what it's about. Uh, I'll give you the IMDb definition. It says it's an idiosyncratic FBI agent investigates the murder of a young woman in the even more idiosyncratic town of Twin Peaks. I think that's a fair, that's as fair of an assessment as you're going to get in one sentence. Uh, Wikipedia's definition. The series follows an investigation headed by FBI Special Agent Dale Cooper and local Sheriff Harry S. Truman into the murder of homecoming queen Laura Palmer in the fictional town of Twin Peaks, Washington. The show's narrative draws on elements of detective fiction but its uncanny tone supernatural elements and campy melodramatic portrayal of eccentric characters also draws from american soap opera and horror tropes like much of lynch's work it is distinguished by surrealism offbeat humor and distinctive cinematography lynch has a very kubrickian sort of style but it's a little more abstract well way more abstract than kubrick It's not for everybody. Now, the show is not paced like a Lynch movie. There's certain episodes he directed that he definitely does that in there, but it's not. Some of his films, when you watch them, it's over the top. All right. So Twin Peaks, it had the first season. It was eight episodes aired on ABC of all places. You wouldn't believe it when you watch it. You'll say, this was on TV? Eight episodes that ran on ABC starting April 8th in 1990. Then season two started in September of 1990. Season two was 22 episodes, a massive season. And it ran from September 1990 through June of 91. Then it got canceled. Or at some point it got canceled. And then in 92, the prequel, Fire Walk With Me was released to theaters, and some say it's Lynch's greatest work, his greatest greatest film. And I've seen several Lynch films, and I kind of agree with that. I agree with it. It's a really great movie. It's, it was the turning point for me, where I really fell in love with Twin Peaks, was the movie. And then, season three. This amazing show 
put the icing on its own cake. Season 3 released in 2017 on Showtime. 18 episodes. Exactly 25 years after Season 2. Which is pretty amazing. Um... Because, and you'll and you'll find out why and and that this is the balance I have to do when when you become a supporter and you're going behind the scenes with me over this next year of Twin Peaks talk, I'm gonna ride this sort of balance of trying to not spoil the plot in case you're watching the episodes as we go along because I'm going through every single episode and yet trying to sort of incorporate some symbolism. I'm gonna try my best. If you're very sensitive to plot spoilers, though, I would advise you to go ahead and, and get going, because I might, I might uh, spoil a couple things here and there. But I'm gonna try not to. All right. And like for instance, when I say season three was released 25 years after season two, it's part of the plot line, which is absolutely mind blowing. I when I <laughs> when I found that out, I said, "That's insane." Lynch is absolutely insane. Lynch and Frost. How did they do this? But they did it. Then, when I was talking to my team, the Double R Diner team there, I was going through these shows, and they're like, oh, yeah, and there's a bunch of books you got to read. And at the time, I said, I don't want to, no. I barely want to watch all these shows. Now I got to read books? But now I, I, you know, I'm obsessed there's many books. There's in 1990, right after the beginning of the first season, they released The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer, which is, again, a massive part of the plot line, as you will find out. And it was written by da- uh, David Lynch's daughter, Jennifer Lynch. And I actually listened to the audiobook version, which is the one I would um, recommend. Because Laura Palmer herself narrates it, Cheryl Lee. And she does an amazing job. And honestly, it was my favorite book. I've read most of the books already. Honestly, it was my favorite book. It really found a way to capture this tragedy of this beautiful young homecoming queen who was also kind of a, 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 she's kind of a freak in the sheets. But she got taken down the wrong path. Anyway, it's very tragic. But um, yeah, The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer is the first book. Then in October of 1990, there's Diane, The Twin Peaks Tapes of Agent Cooper by Scott Frost. That's Mark's brother. And I'm listening to that now about maybe halfway. It's a very short one. I'm about halfway through and It sounds like it's just the audio recordings from the show compiled together is what it sounds like so far narrated by Kyle McLaughlin Mr. Uh, Agent Cooper himself then there's the autobiography of FBI Special Agent Dale Cooper My Life My Tapes by Scott Frost released in May of 91 I have not read that then a month later in June of 91, there's a book called Welcome to Tw- Twin Peaks, an access guide to the town by David Lynch, Mark Frost, and Richard Saul Werman. I haven't read that yet. Then before season three released, because they, you know, they usually time this to sort of hype up stuff. The Secret History of Twin Peaks by Mark Frost released October of 2016. And when you read that book, that's when you're going to know. Illuminate, confirm, my God. And the Twin Peaks show is very fascinating. And I'm going to repeat this many times. I think Mark Frost is the repository of occult knowledge and information. And he collaborated with David Lynch, who's the king of speaking to the subconscious through symbolism. And that's why it worked so well. And you can confirm this when you read Mark Frost's The Secret History of Twin Peaks because there's many topics in there that you're going to say, hey, we've talked about that on Isaac's podcast for many, many years. And now I got it. I said, oh, this is why everyone kept telling me to watch Twin Peaks. 
And what's so amazing about Twin Peaks, you watch it, and on the conscious level, all this stuff's happening. And you say, oh, it's kind of like a soap opera with a little bit of horror. But when you're tuned in to the occult symbolism, you say, wait a minute, what's that owl doing there? Or whatever, right? And we're going to go through all those as we go through the show. And you say, okay, well, that's interesting. There's a, there's an owl. But then you think, no, you got to go deeper than that. And you read the books and you say, oh, my God, it is deeper than that. You confirm it. So it's like only for those who know what to look for will find it because it, they don't beat you over the head with it. I mean, you'll go five, six, seven hours with no, no illuminate confirmed symbolism. And then all of a sudden, boom, there it is. For five seconds, then gone. And it, it's pretty amazing. But the book is where they really reveal everything. But I'm going to reveal absolutely everything because it doesn't piece all the pieces together in a way that explains what's happening. Now, truth be told, I don't know what's happening. That's why you're going behind the scenes with me as we go on this journey to try to figure it out. I've got a whole, I've got pages and pages of notes and I'm trying to figure out I'm the guy with the red string I'm trying to figure it out and we're going to do it together and by at the end of this episode I'm going to tease you with all the things all the things that uh that uh you're going to see on this show then the last book Twin Peaks the final dossier by Mark Frost released October uh October 31st of 2017 he released it on Sawin on purpose Yes, of course. And of course, there's tons of fan books written about the series. Some of them are collections of essays. One that routinely pops up that I have not read is called Reflections, an Oral History of Twin Peaks by Brad Dukes. There's tons of fan theory videos. I haven't watched them yet. Team Double R Diner sent me a four-hour fan theory video. I'm trying to piece my own theories together first. Then I'm going to consume the other theories and say, okay, this is maybe where it's right and where it's wrong, what they missed. I already feel like they missed a bunch. Um, the fans, and here's the issue. The fans are very dedicated. They oftentimes get tattoos about the show. They'll show up to various festivals and comic cons all over the country because they still get together. There's Twin Peaks gatherings. So like the dedication and the cult following this show has is what makes this whole project a real issue for me. Because I fell in love with the show, now I want to do the show justice. All right? I, For instance, I wrote a whole book about the Star Wars series, the first seven movies. And I like Star Wars. I don't, I'm not in love with it. It's a good, it's a good, I like Star Wars, right? Lots of nostalgia from when I was a kid. And that also has a big, nerdy, devoted fan base. But I, I wasn't in love with it. It was fine. Okay, so I I look up some of the characters and try to figure out how they relate to each other. So I get it generally right. Because to me, I'm just like, look, I'm just trying to explain the symbolism. I don't care if Luke said some obscure reference to his sister on episode four. Whatever. Like, I don't care, right? But now I'm in love with the show and I want to do it justice and I want to contribute something new because my fear is that I'm not going to, there's not many stones left unturned, but I know, I know we're going to do a good job. We're going to leave, find some new evidence here, right? Like I found a couple big things that I suspect aren't out there, but again, I haven't dug around the fan theories yet. Like some people are obsessed with this show. Okay. And I'd love to get a tattoo. Yes. I like to collect them all. Um, I should, in fact, I should do up a, f- a few designs and have you guys vote on them. Wouldn't that be fun? Maybe, maybe some some listeners who are into Twin Peaks can draw up a couple. That'd be cool. But there was a festival apparently every year from 1993 to 2019, a fan festival up where this pl- thing was filmed. From what I can see online, from what I read, it got shut down by CBS slash Showtime. That's what the claim is. Why? I don't know. 
you would look at the dates and you would say, well, it's probably because of the pandemic of 2020. But that's not what I'm seeing online. And I tried to confirm with the the main focal point person who runs that festival. I wrote them an email. They haven't written back yet. That's a real bummer, right? Because I guess the sometimes the the actors and actresses would show up at these things. Pretty cool. Okay, now this let's go through the creators of the show david lynch and mark frost now david lynch very famous director he did my first lynch film i saw was lost highway when it came out i had no idea what was going on i think that's the one with bill pullman right i think i had the soundtrack on cd it was a really good soundtrack uh but he did lost highway he did mulholland drive both of those had themes of secret societies and elites and ho- the Hollywood machine. David Lynch infamously obsessed with the Wizard of Oz and Transcendental Meditation. We talked about that on the Wizard of Oz shows. And in fact, we're going to go deeper into David Lynch. Not today. We don't have time for that today. We're going to go into his bio later because obviously he's a very interesting character. But the other creator, Mark Frost... This guy's interesting. He, in my opinion, is the unsung hero of Twin Peaks. His interests indicate that he is the possibly the mastermind of the story and the occult symbolism behind it, especially because he wrote those books that confirm a lot of the ideas that I had when I was watching the show. He, uh, he got his start. He was working lighting on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Then he wrote for Hill Street Blues, and he was also a writer for a film called The Believers with Martin Sheen. And if you haven't seen it, Martin Sheen, it's about how he's the psychologist. He works with the police, and he has to investigate these ritualistic murders of children and devil worshipers. They're sacrificing kids to the devil. (laughs) And in the movie, he yells at his son every five minutes. Uh, Anyway. I just I actually just watched this cuz I was I, I I started doing all the tangential film uh research, you know, I watched The Believers, I watched Blue Velvet again. Um I watched Mulholland Drive. That was the first time I had seen that. Uh there's a couple others. Anyways, David Lynch and Mark Frost teamed up because they were working on a Marilyn Monroe show show called Venus Descending which was based on a book called Goddess, which all will make sense when you hear, when you get in the supporter section and you we unpack the first episode of season one of Twin Peaks. It's all going to make sense. But David Lynch's agent, Tony Krantz, told him that he should do a show about a real American town. Like in Blue Velvet, there's a, American count American town called Lumberton. It was filmed in North Carolina. A fictional town, of course. And it has a lot of similarities to Twin Peaks if you watch Blue Velvet. It's this logging town. It has a sawmill. Uh it has um has a crazy lady who talks about a log. It's all there, right? And then if you know, and again we're gonna go through David Lynch's bio a little bit more, but his background, he grew up in Idaho, in small town Idaho. So it all makes sense, right? And originally the show, Twin Peaks, was supposed to be about a town in North Dakota. But there wasn't enough trees there, apparently, so they changed the title to Northwest Passage. And the location was changed to Washington. And they came up with this idea to have an unsolved mystery about the murder of the girl next door. And this girl next door was leading a double life. And the idea of the doppelganger comes up a lot. We're going to talk about that on this, uh, in this analysis, but it's apparently based on the murder of Hazel Irene drew in New York back in 1908 because Mark Frost spent his summers in New York near where this had happened. And the claim back then from the local folks, was that the woods were haunted by her ghost. And that's a theme in Twin Peaks, that there's something wrong in those woods. There's some dark forces in the woods. So 
both this real life case of Hazel Drew and the fictional Twin Peaks case of Laura Palmer. There were these young, beautiful women. They both got wrapped into local political elites. Hazel Drew worked for some prominent Republican politicians. There was a lot of secret double lives and such. A lot of mysterious ideas behind the murders. So to wrap up this team of David Lynch and Mark Frost, my overall take on this creation of theirs is that Mark Frost was the mastermind of occult knowledge. David Lynch was the mastermind of symbolism and speaking to the subconscious. And they're both needed to implement this work of art known as Twin Peaks. Next, let's talk about the music. I don't even know how to put into words how beautiful the music of Twin Peaks is. Yeah, I know that seems corny. It also the way it's filmed and the way the music goes, it has it really captures some really good early 90s nostalgia even though David Lynch's works usually don't have a very defined time frame. But David Lynch worked with composer Angelo Badal. Oh boy, I heard this name a million times on the uh, David Lynch bio. Badalamenti. Angelo Badalamenti. I'm going to call him Angelo from here on out. Because I forget how Lynch pronounced the name. Badalamenti, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, Angelo worked with Lynch on Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive. But fun fact, he also did the score for Christmas Vacation and Nightmare on Elm Street 3. The best Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Well, I don't know. The first one's probably the best. The third one's a very close second. Those are the Dream Warriors. Anyway, Wikipedia. Listen to this stuff. Wikipedia says that in 1995, Angelo asked a woman named Marianne Faithful to write lyrics for a song that he got onto the soundtrack of The City of Lost Children. I've not seen that movie, but The City of Lost Children is a film about an entity that kidnaps children and steals their dreams. Sounds interesting, does it not? And Marianne Faithful, that's a very interesting person. I've discussed her in my past books like the Rocky Horror Picture Show book I wrote, and the Star Wars Conspiracy. She was working with the occult filmmaker Kenneth Anger on films like Lucifer Rising. She played the role of baby-slaying Lilith on that movie. Uh, This is back when she was dating Mick Jagger in the 60s and 70s, and Mick Jagger infamously got tied up into her witchcraft stuff. And when when the death at Altamont happened, he got bugged out. And he was like, I'm not messing around with this occult stuff anymore. Anyway, Angelo died, unfortunately, of natural causes at the age of 85 on December 11th, 2022. So not too long ago, unfortunately, right? Next, with the music, we have to talk about Julie Cruz. Also a fascinating story. She's a singer who worked with Lynch and Angelo. She um, she did an album called Floating Into the Night, and Lynch and Angelo wrote the uh, lyrics for that album. And several tracks from that are part of the Twin Peaks soundtrack. Uh, Falling, in particular, is kind of the most known one. Um, but the lyrics were written by David Lynch. Julie Cruz, no relation to the great Tom Cruise. Um, (laughs) She played the role of Ginger in stage adaptations of Wizard of Oz books. So there's another Wizard of Oz link to David Lynch. Maybe that's where he found her. I don't know. And she toured with one of my favorite bands of all time, the B-52s. She was a stand-in replacement for Cindy Wilson for, I think it was like 10 years. Long time. Now here's where it's unfortunate. She suffered from 
depression and lupus. And she said, but I'm not going to get buried. I'm going to have my ashes mixed in with my dogs. They're going to spread my ashes across Arizona. And Arizona is going to turn blue. It's not going to be a red state anymore. I, you know, political affiliations here, right? But what's sad is she died of, she committed suicide at age 65 uh, because of all these struggles she had. And she died on June 9th, 2022. Again, very recently. And her friend who was with her when she died uh, said she was playing the B-52's song, Rome. One of, one of the best B-52 songs during the transition because she was about to take the next step on her journey. So, uh, very sad. Very sad uh, that the score from the Twin Peaks show is uh, from folks that are no longer with us. Now let's talk about the location. And I'm going to butcher this name, and I need to get the name figured out because, again, there's lots of Twin Peaks geeks. <laughs> uh, you thought I was going to say Twin Peaks nerds, but I can't resist. Twin Peaks geeks out there are going to light me up for saying it wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway. Snoqualmie, Snoqualmie, Washington, as well as North Bend and Fall City, which are all pretty close to each other. These were the primary filming locations for all the exterior stock footage like you see on the opening credits. The Snoqualmie Falls are the famous ones you see, the waterfalls you see on the uh, credits. But apparently all the exterior shots were filmed in wooded areas of Malibu, California, with the interior shots done on sets in San Fernando Valley warehouses. Now, and you can see lots of these... uh, they still do sort of like tours, I guess. I don't know if tours is the right word. They they pay homage to Twin Peaks in those towns still. At the Double R Diner, they're doing a big... They have a big to-do going on right now, raising funds to put a new neon sign up for the Double R because it's got a different name in real life. It's not the Double R, but they celebrate it still. They sell merchandise and stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, in fact, someone reached out to me on Instagram, and they said they live up there, and they said they uh, go to those festivals. In fact, if you're listening, person, hit me up again. Hopefully, it doesn't get lost in the messages. And let me know, what do they still do festivals or not? I don't, I don't know. I, I th- it said it shut down. But then there's a Twin Peaks Day on February, it was the 24th every year. It's also very confusing. Anyway, so that's where they filmed all the stuff. Well, there's a mini soap opera within the soap opera that is Twin Peaks. And that mini soap is called Invitation to Love. And you catch two to ten seconds of this show every so often. And it's pretty interesting, pretty entertaining. You can watch them all back to back on YouTube. Someone compiled all of them. But, or so I'm told. But the, the... Interior shots for this Invitation to Love show were done at a place called the Ennis House. This is a very famous home built by Frank Lloyd Wright in the 1920s. Films like Blade Runner and House on Haunted Hill were shot there. Both both some of the greatest movies. I love those movies. I just watched Blade Runner for the first time last year. I said, where has this been my whole life? I loved it. So is House on Haunted Hill, the new one, the old one. They're great. Dope. This is a dope story. But anyways, the design of the Ennis House is based upon Maya Temples. Maya Temples is where they used to do sacrifice of the kids, like Chichen Itza. They'd sacrifice these kids to the gods, and they would, they would bury them in the cenotes, the underwater caves, because they believed that some of these cenotes like uh, Exobaba were the entrance to the underworld. I'm going to read to you from Reuters.com. Archaeologist Guillermo del Anda from the University of Yucatan pieced together the bones of 127 bodies discovered at the bottom of one of Chichen Itza's sacred caves and found over 80% were likely boys between the ages of 3 and 11. The other 20% were mostly adult men who scuba dives to uncover Mayan jewels and bones. 
He said children were often thrown alive to their watery graves to please the Mayan rain god Chuck. Some of the children were ritually skinned or dismembered before being offered to the gods. It was thought that the gods preferred small things, and especially the rain god had four helpers that were represented as tiny people. So the children were offered as a way to directly communicate with Chalk. Which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, my hip-hop conspiracy book, Sacrifice Magic Behind the Mic, uh, I do for sure talk about blood sacrifice and how the Mayan cultures and all these people did it, but I think we talked about Chalk, the rain god. Because if you remember, uh, there was a big stink about the rain man, Eminem channeling this demonic rain man. And I connect those with Moloch and Baal and all that. Archaeologists previously believed young female virgins were sacrificed because their remains, which span from around 850 A.D. until the Spanish colonization, were fa- often found adorned with jade jewelry. Now, we talked about this before. I'm going to talk to you about it again. Fascinating they would mention that and then not say another word. Because if you recall, we talked about jade jewelry in my first alien book, Aliens, UFOs, and the Occult, Use Your Illusion 1. I'm going to read you from it to save you some time. Tom DeLong, and I was, this is what I wrote in there. Tom DeLong and Peter Lavenda's book, uh, and I'm referring to, uh, oh man, what's the name of it? Secret Machines, with a K, S-E-K, the number of magic, the 11th letter of the alphabet. Because these guys are into occult magic. Okay, Tom DeLonge and Peter Lavenda's book devotes a fair amount of material into the concept of human sacrifice with citations of ancient cultures sacrificing children to bloodthirsty gods. This is from Secret Machines. I quote from it. To the Aztecs, jade had symbolic significance. It was used as a euphemism for blood as well as for heart. In children, it was believed that their blood and their hearts were still green and often the word Jade is used to refer to their unripe and therefore pure status. The divine energy was very much alive and strong in children. As people became older, the divine energy became snarled and twisted in their bodies, entrapping the god within. The only way to release that imprisoned deity was through sacrifice, and the best mode of sacrifice was one in which the spirit was wrenched free of the body, the limbs severed, the head severed, the heart removed from the chest. Like the Gnostics, the Aztecs believed that matter was the prison of spirit. Unlike the Gnostics, the Aztecs believed that the best way to free the spirit was to destroy the material basis in which it was trapped. One could say they took the Gnostic attitude to its logical conclusion. The sacrifice had to be violent and bloody. There was no gentle poisoning, no mere suffocation. There were a very few cases where victims were squeezed to death or smashed against a godstone, for instance. There had to be blood, for blood was the spirit. And, oh, uh, the godstone sounds very similar to the movie Midsummer, where they push them old people off the... Well, they they jump to their death to a massive stone. And then the one guy doesn't die, so the chief shaman of the the tribe there at midsummer shows up with a big donkey kong hammer and smashes his skull in like it's a fair game or something now fun fact i told you there was an epstein connection there's a billionaire named ronald burkle who owned the ns house in the 2010s the whole uh, from 2011 to 2019 and during this time he was hanging out with bill clinton and jeffrey epstein Which, you know, just a reminder, this is after Epstein had already been arrested for uh, messing with kids. I'm going to read you from Hollywood Reporter. In 2015, Gawker published the flight logs from Epstein's jet, which showed that Kevin Spacey, Chris Tucker, and such powerful players as Bill Clinton, Clinton and investor Ron Burkle took one flight to Africa. A source close to Burkle said... He was invited by Clinton, assumed the ride was vetted, and flew home on a commercial jet after finding Epstein to be quote-unquote creepy. There's a lot of folks. Even Bill Gates claimed this too. 
Was there a lot of folks who got caught hanging out with Epstein and whether it's true or not said, wow, that guy's kind of a creep. Are they good, good people? Are they bad people? You know, it's kind of, isn't it weird though? It's kind of like my, my first semester with Penn state when the Sandusky scandal kicked off, I said, Oh great. Good timing. It's like Joe Paterno, right? Old Joe Pa. He knew what was going on, and he told the people above him, and then he was just like, hey, I told somebody. And everyone looked at him and said, bro. And you just were, like, cool with them letting him keep his job? There's, like, this real seedy underbelly of all that stuff going on. And you could argue that some of those elements show up in Twin Peaks uncomfortably. All right? Especially when you read, when you uh, learn about Laura Palmer's character. I mean, she was in high school. She was 17. I think she was 17. I'll have to look through my notes. Anyway, so that's the primer for Twin Peaks. Now, I'm going to tell you on this project, this behind the scenes of Twin Peaks, we're calling it the Gray Lodge. All right. Why am I calling it the Gray Lodge? It's because it's the reconciled opposites, the union of opposites, folks, the black and white, the good and evil in Twin Peaks. Because that's one of the main themes of the show is duality. You'll find out in the show there's a white lodge and there's a black lodge. Well, we're in the gray lodge looking at both ones. (laughs) All right. It's fun, right? I'm trying to make this fun. You can enter. You can choose your path. Like I always say, you know. Some people like occult stuff. Hey, good for you. Just don't hurt nobody. You're messing with the kids. Some people, Christian words, that's great. I love that for you. Just don't mess with the kids. Try to be nice. Because I don't know what the right answer is. I get confused often. I ultimately believe in uh, Christ. But sometimes organized religion I have questions about. And I say, man, I don't know about this. This seems a little wacky. Some of these occult practices, I hear about them, I think, man... Those, that's really helpful to some people. I hope I'm not demonizing all these occultists because, you know, there's white witches and there's black witches. There's white lodges and black lodges. All I do know is I would advocate don't go to the black lodge. That's the only thing I would advocate, but what do I know? So we're going in the gray lodge. In fact, I searched the term because I was so excited when I thought of it. I thought, that's it. Because I've been thinking about this for months. And I Googled it, and turns out there was a bar in Philly called the Gray Lodge that actually was paying homage to Twin Peaks. They had, like, hidden owls and stuff on it. So that's kind of cool. But apparently that bar went out of business or someone bought it or something. I don't know. Anyway, I've been trying to figure out how I'm going to approach this massive project of analyzing all of the symbolism of Twin Peaks. Especially because, if you know, I was working on a course. That's right. I was going to do a course on occult symbolism and all this and you know because that's what everybody does now they make courses i could sell it to you for a thousand dollars and you get in on there and buy me my next helicopter but i i said you know what my heart's not in it my heart's not in it you know where my heart is it's on twin peaks so you're basically going to get a course in occult symbolism in the gray lodge because there's so much to wrap your head around There's no way in hell I could do this in a couple episodes of the podcast. There's just no way. Plus, there's several resources already out there that have deep dived. There's many podcasts that have gone through every single episode of this show with people who put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into it, okay? Even though I'll argue that most of them will not be covering the same ground that we will, they just will not they do not have the background i would argue i haven't listened to them yet i don't know i've been listening to the podcast diane i listened to a few of them right i'm currently working on the podcast diane that's my favorite one so far and they actually have a really good working knowledge of occult symbolism but it's a very small percentage of the discussion whereas i will be focused specifically on that mostly so here's what we're going to do i'm planning on don't hold me to anything you're going to hear here i'm planning on writing a book about this about this topic because twin peaks embodies a bit of everything we've talked about for so many years symbolism hidden in plain sight 
speaking to the subconscious. And I know this is happening with the show because I've been mentally obsessed with it since I finished it. I, You know I love horror movies. I love movies. I finish this show. I'll sit down to watch a movie I want to see. And it's got a 50-50 chance of me finishing it because I'm thinking about Twin Peaks like a... I'm I'm smitten. I'm smitten with my side piece, Twin Peaks. I think, man, mm, I got to get back in those Twin Peaks. And the next thing I know, I'm turning off the movie. I'm like, nope, let's watch Twin Peaks again. Because I'm working on watching it a second time through right now. But uh, anyway, barring a complete mental breakdown, this is the plan. And I'm 90% committed to this as the plan. Writing the book... I want you, the supporters, to join me in the Gray Lodge of unpacking all these ma- this massive topic. You get behind the scenes in the preparation of the book and the theory and all that stuff. Hell, you might become a part of it. I don't know. Depends on what I find out. And I'll be doing a full analysis of every single episode of Twin Peaks. Some are going to be short episodes because I'm, I'm already like halfway through season two. And when I look at my notes, like season two, episode four... There's not a lot of occult symbolism going on. I'll walk through the show and tell you what happened, but, I mean, that might be a 15-minute show. Whereas season two, episode one, or season one episode, pilot episode, it's an hour and a half. It's a full movie. Like, that's a full-ass episode right there. But anyways, I'm going to do a full analysis of every single episode, plus Firewalk with me, plus the books, Plus, I'll be incorporating relevant information that will be in the book about David Lynch from his biography. Jack Parsons plays a massive role in all this. James Selby Downard, the atomic bomb, as well as info I've relevant info from my Aliens books because that plays a role here too. How long is this going to take? If I had to guess, I would say about a year, give or take. And these episodes you'll get when you're in the Gray Lodge, I'm only going to put them on the supporter feeds. You know, part of me, you know you know how crazy I am with this right now? Part of me thought, I'm just going to stop doing a call symbolism and pop culture episodes, and I'm only going to do Twin Peaks. That's it. I'm just going to do it for like five months. That's all we're going to talk about. But I was like, no, some people don't won't care about this. So I'm giving you the opportunity, if you do care, to be, on, be in the uh, Gray Lodge with me. And the way it's going to work is that I'll be releasing all the information on the supporter feeds, and it will be varied, okay? You might get an episode a week. You might get an episode a month. You might have to wait two months to get an episode. I can't promise you because it depends on the research, and it depends on my schedule. Example, if I'm going to talk about James Selby Downard, I mean, it's going to take me months to compile all my notes and finish reading the books I have about him. But I, I guarantee you this as a supporter, you're still going to get your bonus episode every month. Some months it might just be the Twin Peaks show. Some months it might just be the regular bonus show. And many months, you're going to get both. So you're kind of getting two bonus episodes now. Um, that's my goal is to give you both every month. That's the plan. Pending on life situations, of course. Because I know not everyone, I know not everyone out there is going to care about Twin Peaks, but they should, but they might not. So I, I still want to give my supporters the bonus episode that they want to hear. All right, so I'm I'm keeping that in the back of my mind, but I also, man, I'm going full steam ahead. When I say I'm going to do a book, I, I we're going for it. All right. So of course, all of this subject to change a tiny bit, not a ton, but if I know how this experience goes in writing books, these other topics will start popping up. Pop, pop, pop from the ether, and I'll get detoured. So, and and now's a good time. Shout out, shout out to some people that helped me on this journey so far. Dr. Anteater and Team Double R Diner, Ryan and Riley, who've been very instrumental in guiding me down this path of Twin Peaks. I've had my ups and downs. I wanted to bail. I'm glad I didn't. And the reason I know this is important is is based on feeling and intuition. There were several moments throughout the show, Twin Peaks, that made me think about different occult topics. 
And like I said, there's not a lot of overt messages or symbolism. It's very subtle. But when you start peeling back the layers and reading the books and learning about Lynch and Frost, you say, man, they designed this absolutely perfectly. It's meant to bury into the subconscious. And it's an initiation because only the initiates who who start to dig into this are the deserving ones, right? It's like Fight Club when you're out on the porch. And Brad Pitt comes out and says, you're too fat, fatty. Well, only the real initiates who take the abuse and wait for the door to be opened will be allowed in. That's kind of what the show is because on the one level, they play the show and most of the public taps out because they're like, dude, this is goofy. What are they talking about? But then some people say, man, that was really weird. I want to learn more. I want to know what was going on there. So they pick up the books. And then they read the books and they and maybe they're satisfied. They say, oh, okay, all right. It has to do with this, that, and the other. All right. But then some people say, wait a minute, what? And that's where I come in. I'm going to be that third stage um, initiation, we'll say, into the Grey Lodge. So we're going to do this together. We're going to find that deeper meaning together. And here's a rough list of all the symbolism we're going to cover on all these episodes from the film and the books and the shows. This is just a sample of what we're going to talk about in the Grey Lodge. Owls, entities, tulpas, aliens, ritual magic, blood sacrifice, goddesses, duality, secret societies, transcendental meditation, the atomic bomb, Project Blue Book, MJ-12, Tibet, Kabbalah, the Scarlet Woman, she's full of secrets, Carl Young's shadow, adrenochrome, traumatic abuse, dissociative identity disorder, altered states for contact, sex magic, the mauve zone, ball, black lodges and white lodges. It's a lot. We're going to talk about David Lynch. We're going to talk about Jack Parsons. We're going to talk about Helena Blavatsky, Alistair Crowley, James Selby Downard, Wizard of Oz, It, Stephen King's It, Mark Frost, the cast, the crew. In fact, that's going to be the next episode, only for the Grey Lodge initiates. And it's going to take forever, right? It's going to take forever, but one thing I've learned on, because this will be my 10th book, one thing I've learned, and, you know, Demi's Mandala might be working on me. I decided, you know, I enjoy Twin Peaks so much. This is the first time I'm going to slow down and enjoy the journey. Because before, I would get, like, obsessive about these topics, and I'd be researching the hell out of it and trying to hurry up, and every spare second I'm writing. I'm taking my time with this. Taking my time doing it right. I'm going to be very present with this. And I'm serious. This this is probably going to take about a year. I mean, just, like I said, it's like 50 hours of content. If you And that doesn't include the books and the big topics that we all need to understand about all these big characters involved. But it's important. Otherwise, I wouldn't begin this trip. And I just know that it's very important. So... And again, I already talked to you about the spoilers. There's going to be kind of some spoilers here and there. I can't promise you that I won't ruin something here or there. I'm going to try my best not to. But I'm going to walk you through every episode. And honestly, it's not about the ending of the episode or of of the show. It's really not. I don't know how much that really matters. But, yeah, anyway. um, Like I said, uh, I'm going to squeeze out these bonus episodes Sometimes you might get one a month, sometimes two a month, sometimes three a month, sometimes one every other month. Um, But that means I've got to sort of accommodate my schedule, right? Like I'm going to take on less appearances, dare I say. Um, And it depends on what I got going on in my personal life. Sometimes my day job gets busy and it kind of screws me up. But yeah, she already know the whole deal. Um, Also, no guarantees on the video version. Uh, on that in that same vein i do a video version of my podcast for rockfin as well as my tier two supporters uh no promises on a video version of the twin peaks analysis i'm going to try to get the audio clips at the very minimum of the dialogue that i'm going to be talking about but i can't promise you i'll have the time for the video that takes up a fair chunk of time to do the videos 
Uh, it'll just depend, right? I just want to be upfront with you so that you know this is more of a behind the scenes type of deal, a work in progress. I'm going to do my best, all right? So here we go. If you want to be in the Gray Lodge with us, you got to get on the supporter feeds. And I'm going to give you that discount, that coupon code here. So hang in there. Uh, and as you know, I'm, you know, I'm on the Rockfin Apple Podcast Premium. That's probably the easiest way to sign up if you're on if you have an Apple device. It's the click of a button, it takes a second. It's definitely the easiest way to sign up. Patreon is the most popular option by far. They'll give you an RSS link, and you just have to click it and activate it on your phone into whatever podcast device you like. Uh, I've heard because I've heard some people don't like the Patreon app. I I don't use the app. I I take the RSS codes that I get because I subscribe to some Patreon folks. I just copy the RSS link they give me and I put it in Apple Podcast. Boom, seamless. So on a, in all reality, Patreon is probably the best overall because you're going to get the free books that I can't give you on the Apple Premium. I can't give you the free books, stuff like that. Um, and I would imagine that there's going to be a lot of Twin Peaks geeks out there on the Patreon feed, and they're going to want to chat it up in the comment section of these Twin Peaks bonus episodes. If I was to guess, if I was a betting man, that's what I'm guessing is going to happen. So you probably want to be a part of that. But for the thrifty spender, I'm going to let you in the VIP section at cost. I'm going to give you one more try to do this. We did this a couple years ago. It was very popular. I'm going to give you another shot to check it out at cost for me. Um, you know, and I want you to try it because there's, there's, you have to copy and paste. It's a little clunkier than the other ones. I'm going to email you with a private RSS code. And then, like always, you copy it and paste it into your podcast app. Some people have a hard time with that. And I want you to make sure it goes nice and smooth. Don't use the Castos app that they're going to promote. It's garbage. Everyone hates it. I use the Apple Podcast app. It works like an absolute champ. Very simple. You sign up for the VIP section. It emails you the RSS code. You copy it, paste it into your Apple Podcast, and you're done. Or whatever podcast app you use. Hell, I can even help you if you have a hard time. I'll even refund you if it doesn't work for you. How's that sound? So you, what you do is you go to IlluminatiWatcher.com, hit the VIP link on the menu up top, and you scroll down. You're going to sign up for Tier 1. Tier 1 in the VIP section. And you're going to get you're going to get access to the two most popular books that I've written for free. You now will have the ad-free version of the podcast. You you shouldn't hear one single ad. So if you're hearing ads, you, you didn't do it right. No more ads. 170 bonus episodes plus all the Grey Lodge episodes we're about to do. And it's only going to cost you two bucks. Coupon expires July 1st. That coupon code is going to be Cherry Pie, all one word. It's a cherry pie that'll kill you. Cherry Pie, all one word. Could be all caps or all lowers, either way. Coupon expires July 1st, so you only have until now, the moment you hear this, till the end of June 2023, to make this happen. So go to the VIP section at Illuminati.com, scroll down, there's a paragraph that says, ready to be via VIP, near the bottom of the page. There's a drop-down link, choose Tier 1 at the bottom of the form where you put your credit card number, and you're going to see a link that says, add coupon. You're then going to type in Cherry Pie, all lowers or all caps, hit apply, and you sign up. Two bucks, you're in. You're in. And, uh, you know, furry food losers, listen up. If uh, if you're not trying to become a supporter, it's cool. I get it. Inflation, Black Rob's buying up all the houses and the farmland. I get it. You are going to have to wait a year or whatever it takes, and then you can just get the book. It's going to be great. And also, uh, I'm going to release these episodes on the free feed after I release the book. Around that time. You know? I don't know. Maybe it'll be a few months down the road. Maybe it'll be six months. Maybe it'll be a year. I don't know yet. We're going to find out. But, you know, so if you're a free feed loser, don't get too sad. But I'm, I'm telling you, it's only two bucks to get in there. See if you like it. You're going to love it. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. So uh, check, out, check out all the stuff. I got all the links in the show notes. And I want you to sign up now because guess what's coming in, I, I would guess, by the end of next week. Maybe even this weekend. Hell, I don't know how froggy I'm feeling. We're going to go through a whole episode going through all the actors and actresses, their characters, their background, their history, uh, 
it's actually really fascinating. You you won't believe some of these characters. Uh, I'm working on putting in awards for like favorite character, uh, you know, hottest male, hottest female, that kind of thing. And we're going to go through the background of some of these folks, find out who they were married to, who they were dating. You're going to find a lot of these people were connected through the show. Um, to, uh, connections to the Maharishi. I mean, it's uh, the most insane one on here that, uh, that I remember off the top of my head is a solid connection to Discordianism. That's right. And Carrie Thornley, um, Lee Harvey Oswald. It's insane. You won't believe it. So... You're not going to want to miss that one. That's going to be the, the second episode of The Grey Lodge. And you can only get it one way. That's to become a supporter. So hit the links in the show notes as always. And until next time, stay woke. Stay woke.